after last week's 20 minute red card discussion, we thought it was only right to call in an RFU international referee. Joining myself, Brendan, Nick, and Chris today, Luke Pierce discusses all before we preview the autumn internationals. Hey guys, it's Ollie here. Um, just a small apology for this episode. We had a few technical issues. We're using this new software, um, which the viewers on YouTube will particularly be able to appreciate. And essentially, it was my fault. I didn't realize that the recording was a two-step process, unlike on Zoom, where we used to record it, where it was a one-step process. So around the minute mark is where the episode jumps in. So it's just getting straight down to the red card discussion with Luke Pierce. But in any case, I hope you enjoy. Um, we haven't seen, and I don't want to curse it too soon, we haven't seen too much controversy. We haven't seen too much referees being the headline figure, which which is obviously the aim of the game. Um, and we've seen a, a, a relatively competitive premiership with now the aim of replicating that when we go into the world scene, which I'm sure that you guys are going to mention the, the law tweaks and changes that we're going to have to put up with um, and try and make the best of and hopefully take everyone with us rather than, than working against us. 100%. Well, look, let's let's cut to the chase, the 20-minute red card. Um, we tried to explain it last week. Um, explain it to us and we'll see where we went wrong. Okay, so for Autumn, Interna uh, Autumn Nation series, uh, there will be two uh, kinds of red card in theory. So at the moment, we just have a penalty, a yellow or a red. That's how we've always known um, the sanction kind of sequence for referees and players. We're now adding in a red card, direct red card, which is not replaceable. So for acts of thuggery or violence, or for those who know the law book far better than I do, laws in the 9.12, they will be acts that a referee or on-field officials can deem serious enough that a team need a direct red card. That will mean, as I said, that that team can't replace that person and will play the rest of the match with 14 players. If, however, it doesn't fit that kind of criteria, so take, for example, a tackle that just goes wrong. It's a, it's a what may be seen as a rugby kind of slight accident. A player just mistimed something or has just got the height slightly wrong. As on-field refs, we might decide to go if it reach the yellow card threshold. You'll see us revert back to the bunker, which obviously used back in the 23 World Cup. And once it goes to the bunker they can either come back to us and advise that the yellow card remains a yellow card, or it will be upgraded to a red card, a 20 minute red card. So to make things very clear, once it goes to a bunker, the maximum level of sanction that can be given is a 20 minute red card. And that player can then be replaced and black to 15 players. So that's the, the two differentials. How we're going to communicate that, how we're going to show that on TV is to be, decided in the next couple of days we're conscious that we're now introducing another layer into something that is already a bit complicated anyway um, and we want to make sure as well that we're still leaving room for referees to make the best decision and if i feel that a, an incident is so severe um, and i say acts of thuggery we don't really see many on the rugby pitch anymore i'm glad to say you know when when world rugby showed us the presentation that the, the most recent clip of it was 2019 where uh, the French fellow got sent off against Wales for the elbow in the moor. And that's as kind of, as that's as how thuggery we've got in the last five years. I don't see there being many incidents where we need to go with a direct red 14 players. Um, now, whether that's good, bad or ugly is to be decided by you guys and the, the, the whole rugby population. Um, but it, we wanted that if this 20 minute red card was going to be brought in, we as referees still wanted to have up our sleeve the option of getting rid of someone directly. If we think it's severe, deliberate, really dangerous, um, then we can still do that. And of course, that brings about the conversation about what about a tackle that a referee sees as really bad and really deliberate and really dangerous. And the answer to that, getting ahead of the game a little bit, is yes, a referee can still give a direct red card and continue with 14 players. Will we see many of them? I'm not so sure. How does the way you explain it, uh, Luke, sounds a little bit different to the way the, the RB put it out in their press release. So you, on, as the on-field ref, you don't make the decision about it's a 20-minute red or a red. 
you make the decision whether it's a yellow, which will be reviewed in the bunker, or it's a straight red. Is that is that right? Sorry, Brendan, I'm, I must, I'm getting myself confused with all these different colour cards you've done the last Yeah, the way, the way the World Rugby put it out well, it was a month ago sounded slightly different. It sounded like you, on field, would make the decision penalty, yellow, 20-minute red, or red. It sounds so, to me like you're saying you'll go yellow to be reviewed in the bunker or red. That's your exactly. job as the ref. Oh, don't forget a penalty only. You know, if we TMO yeah, review yeah, something, yeah. it's not that bad. Well, no penalty at all. Exactly, or no foul play. Um, but the but the very clear line in the sand is only we as on field referees can give a direct fourteen man traditional red card. Once we give, once we deem a yellow card minimum, and we do the bunker sign, the maximum that can come back from the bunker is a twenty minute red card. So hopefully Even that if video evidence shows that you might have been a bit light and lenient and in fact it was a bad a, a, quite a bad incident yeah because we're banking on us being good enough that off two or, and, and let's remember why this all got brought in we were taking forever to get to decisions because the 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 result of a yellow or a red is so important we decided that we wanted to see every single angle we were having games last over two hours and that was contributing to kind of a less entertaining game so we brought it all back into well, how can we make it easier how can we take pressure off referees a little bit? So, and this, and also for the fact that we don't want, and, and this of course is open for debate, does it does it really damage the entertainment factor of a game? And that's not that's not my job to create entertainment. My job is to referee and to add to that kind of spectacle if I can, but it's to referee a law book. And the, one of our concerns with this 20 minute red card, when we trialed it. 2022, I think, um, I was down in Australia for Rugby Championship during COVID, and, and that was when it first got brought in. And, and I'll be quite honest, as a, as a person in the middle, it's great because you have all the options in the world. It takes the pressure off the referee in the middle uh, and, and gives that kind of accountability to someone else who's watching way more angles. Will there be the odd occasion where the bunker will see something that we wouldn't have on field? Perhaps. But if an act of thuggery or a really dangerous act is that obvious? And let's always work off the clear and obvious. And that's different to people. But if it's a really bad act of thuggery or a really dangerous play, TV, producers, directors, TMOs should be showing us those angles and that footage when I or we are watching that in the stadium. So we don't want to cause another additional layer of potential inconsistency because what somebody may seem as really dangerous you people may sit on and go, actually, I don't think it's that bad. I think it's a timing issue. So we just wanted to make it very, very clear that once the referee on field determines that it's not a direct red card, then the maximum level is that 20-minute replacement. Um, yeah. And whether that's good, bad or ugly is uh, is obviously open for debate. And as we've seen from both hemispheres, there seems to be a quite you know clear difference in opinion um, in terms of whether that it's good or bad. And I guess, like everything, proof's in the pudding, isn't it? And we haven't done it up north yet with 20-minute red cards. And we shall see if it has the impact that, that is being desired. And let's not forget, it's to the trial. So it can be taken back and gone, no, this isn't working. We're not changing player behavior. We've got to go back to the, to the traditional three kind of sanction levels. But that's where we are at the moment. Look, we're trying to, you know, in, in so many areas, there's an emphasis on speeding up the game. Now, you know, from my perspective, I think that the danger with this is, is that it's another layer and getting the camera angles, et cetera, et cetera, for the referee to get the right decision, because it, everybody's going to want to get the right decision out of a, a particular incident. So... You know, the danger with this for me is, is that it becomes like a, a sort of three or four minute interlude where we're going back because the camera angles in rugby, unfortunately, there's not enough money spent on it. And therefore, we're not in the NFL league in terms of having hundreds of camera angles and so on. It's quite clunky in terms of the amount of time it takes. Um, and, and you have to refer it back and say, can you get me that angle or whatever else? And the whole thing, you know, is going to slow the game down massively it already does slow the game down and it, it puts you i think it puts you sort of centerpiece if you like in a way that probably isn't particularly good for the game 
and there's always these um, kind of uh, things that happen when we tweak the law. And there's always these kind of things that people haven't considered. And you even look at the Scrum, for example, when I started calling the user 18 months ago and was being told off for being so different to everyone else, um, now we're encouraging to use it quicker. Well, the consequence of a unintended consequences, that's the two words I'm looking for. The, the consequence of us penalizing or blowing the whistle for a player taking longer than five seconds is to award a scrum. Well, a scrum takes on average 42, 45 seconds, and that's if the ball comes out of one. So, and if we penalize that scrum, then we take the time out of that player to kick to touch. So we've got to be careful how much we tinker with the laws because there's always something else that will, as you say, Nick, will happen. I think one thing that we're quite clear on in internationals and, and the World Cup was a little bit different because of broadcasters. There was one broadcaster, which helps. We're very clear that we want decisions to be made as quickly as possible based on about two replays, if we can. So that's the kind of rough. Now, a referee may take three or four on the odd occasion if it's a bit complex. We may be able to go, yep, yeah, that's definitely a minimum yellow off one replay. But there's definitely an expectation from World Rugby and from our bosses that we don't want to be stood on these screens forever. And we don't want to be just explaining why we're doing something forever. And that was where we probably got to uh, before uh, all this. And we're into it. Unfortunately, that's that that it seems to me to be the logical um, conclusion of putting another layer into the uh, into the decision making process. And the, and the worry of this, that, and, I, and it's a it's a personal worry. I can't speak on behalf of you know the RFU at the moment. But the worrying part with this is we're kicking the can further down the road. So rather than just the, the, the so-called expert in the middle, the best person for that game on that job, there is a view that that person should be taking responsibility and owning all the decisions. And I, I'm still an old-fashioned referee when I got involved and dad was doing it. The person in the middle should be the one saying good, bad or ugly. Now, if that's wrong or that's right, that's the culpability of the captain of the ship. That's what happens. The danger of this element of trying to speed that is we kick it down the road and we end up someone making the decision who's not the captain of the ship um, and of course can that c word of consistency is what everyone's aiming for the more people you get involved the harder consistency is to gain uh but but like like all these things it we, we got it we got sometimes you got to trial them you got to see how they get on and see how they work and I just think with rugby, and, and again, it's a, probably a more personal view, we've got to get back to keeping this sport and the refereeing of it as simple as possible rather than more complex. And the great irony, Luke, if you might, if, if I may say so, is that you and the fellow RFU refs, who I think as a group are the best in the world, have sort of sorted this out yourself. I've noticed at the end of last season and this season, it's a bit tougher to get that full red, definitely a bit tougher, and, and then you just use the yellow. You've got quite a degree of flexibility with the yellow. And that does it. You've got the yellow and you've got a, an increasingly rarer full red for, like you say, tackles that are obviously high and dangerous, completely reckless or occasional foul play. And the rest of it, you can, Mr. you know, you as the ref, you apply your uh, appreciation of what's going on that day as to whether that's a yellow card. And, or only a yellow card. And that's been working very well. In, in and the, Brendan, in I, think one thing, I think one piece of the pie we miss as well is there is still a sighting officer in the stands who yeah. that if that person were to deem that we've undercooked something and we've gone, ah, we're seeing it as a yellow, but that sighting officer, for, for reasons they may have all their angles in the world within the 24 hours or 48 hours, I'm not quite sure how many they get now, they can still decide to upgrade something. And... What makes me laugh, after 15 years doing this job professionally, it always seems to be with changes down to the referee to, to lead the charge on the change. You know, the, the game requires to be sped up for entertainment reasons, and that's great, but it's the referee who's the one to speed it up. You know, we, we try to make the game safer by reducing the tackle height. The referee is the one that's going to give the outcome of a decision, whether it's a card. And I just think we've got to try and keep it as simple as possible. Now, if it comes out that this trial works really well and players are deliberately trying to get lower, there's no kind of element of people just whacking people high because they know the risk value is lower. Great. Um, that's the concern, I think, for everybody is that 
we've gone really hard on trying to change player behavior. And I think by and large, players have taken that on themselves. And it's been brilliant that you don't get many now uh, intentional high tackles. You really don't. I mean, that we could discuss intent and deliberate till you're blue in the place, but you don't get many players do things deliberately anymore. It's just either they're caught short timing, they're caught up right because of a step inside or whatever it may be. And yeah, I'm just hoping that, that we we have a successful November window. And I go back to my point at the start. The first six weeks in the Gallagher Premiership have been relatively quiet. And I'm sure Paul, my boss, will kill me because we go back at end of November for one round. We need this game to continue in that vein. We need rugby to be spoken about what's happening on the pitch, the entertainment factor, tries being scored, unbelievable players playing really well rather than referees giving decisions. And I, we just got to keep on trying to hammer that home, regardless of the tweaks and changes that are being delivered and be told to make. And we just got to keep that in the forefront of our kind of vision of the sport, I, I feel anyway. So, Luke, remind, remind me what the exact, the, the red card on, on the pitch, remind me what the exact brief is for that, because we had a debate about intent last week and intent being a very difficult thing to judge in a split second decision such as a tackle or a moment of a foul play obviously a punch in the face is slightly different um in most cases anyway so just just go over how that aligns with intent and how that sort of that split second nuance is is distinguished by the by the letter of the new law um so the, the guidance that we've been given and, and bear in mind we don't meet at the lensbury until sunday we're together sunday through to thursday so if we feel something isn't quite right we still have the scope to change things slightly with the understanding that teams are kicking off this weekend so they need the clarity of what's going to happen for the for the first weekend which is really important and not just the teams you know angus gardner um, who, and craig evans who are going out to referee england and up in scotland they need the kind of clarity that they're going to do the same thing just to reiterate, what we can give straight and direct red cards for is anything under law 912. So very boring, and I'm not a law-based person, as you may know, but a player must not physically or verbally abuse anyone. Physical abuse includes, but is not limited to, and that's the key part, it's not limited to biting, punching, contact the eye, eye area, striking with any part of the arm, shoulder, head or knee, stamping, trampling, tripping or kicking. So that's, that's what I think everyone over a pint in a bar would consider kind of thuggerish act, you yeah. know, punching someone on the floor, stamp on the head, which, you know, when you watch clips of age and you watch rugby from old, you know, it happened way more than it does now. And, and I'm hoping, don't want to put a curse on it, that it, we don't see much of it. Where we've got to get to a stage, and I don't think we'll see many, is where we see a deliberate act of high level of danger foul play. And I can't give you any direct examples as of yet because I'm still a little bit uncertain myself on what I would go for for a tackle. You know, if uh, and I always remember the Anton Dupont one in the World Cup, France Uruguay, I think it was, where he broke his cheekbone. That's probably the closest I can recall to being a high level, what I think is deliberate, others may not think is deliberate, act of foul play, and probably the closest I'd get to giving a direct red card. So that's so that's where we are at the moment. I, if, I, if I'm a, if I'm a I would say a betting man, but it's probably not the right term of phrase to use in my job. But if I was a predicting what's going to happen in the next four weeks, I'm hoping we don't see any direct red cards. That's my that's my real hope, and that we see tackles that players just got something slightly wrong, and referees have gone, yeah, that's definitely a yellow card threshold. Now over to my mate who's got all the camera angles and has got ten minutes or eight minutes remaining to look at the best decision possible for that incident. Yeah. And I think that's that's what is going to happen more often than not. So to the best of your knowledge, Luke, uh, is the bunker system in place for every international game over the every, next five or every, six weeks? Every tier one, Chris, every tier one match, the bunker is in play. Um, numerous reasons why. First of all, we simply haven't got the numbers and we've no. got to be careful about opening so the Georgia v, Georgia v Tonga won't have one basically. I don't believe so. Uh, no. And again, that's not just down to our numbers. It also comes down to technology because some of these countries have only just established bringing the TMO in because of external broadcast bands and everything else. So not every single one will. Every tier one match will have the bunker system. So this I go is, back, this I go is back to that that. point about keeping the game simple, Chris. Well, I don't, I, don't, I don't think we are. I don't think we are keeping the game simple. We came out of the World Cup where 
we slowly, slowly, and we didn't get off to a great start, but we slowly convinced people the bunker system was working. We ended with a bang with a red card to Sam Kane. We then go back into premiership in European rugby where we don't have the bunker. We're now getting back to referee sending decisions. Now we've taken everyone with us down that path again. We're now going back into November where we're going, right then, back into the bunker system. And, and I think there's a lot of criticism of rugby in the current day. One thing that I would love to do as a referee in, in our position is just make it as easy to understand for the general punter as possible. And I'm not sure we're doing a great job on that front at the moment. It's the thing that frustrates me more than anything else. I mean, I mean the way you've described it, you described it with considerable clarity, and I can see a logic in all of these, in all of these moves. I mean, there's an undeniable logic around this, but I just, I rugby never seems to be absolutely on the same page, pulling in the same direction all the time. So you, you you've got a class action coming over the hill about head contact and etc. 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 And now we've got this. Um, which is which doesn't fit hand in glove with the general approach to reducing tackle heights and, and and making the game safer. We've got the discrepancy, the further discrepancy between tier one nations and everyone else, just with the with the bunker side of things, which is why I asked the question. There, 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 the, the, Bill Beaumont's just come out as outgoing chairman and raises concerns about the number of substitutes that there are on the bed a number of tactical substitutions and what have you. And now we're saying you've got a 20 minute red card system where someone's going to, you know, every coach in the world is going to want enough replacements sitting on their backsides on a bench to cover whatever might happen on the disciplinary front in a big international. No, nothing ever seems quite to gel. And, and I'm, I'm relieved in a sense that you've said that the game's still wanting in a little bit of, clarity and pulling in the same direction and what have you and making it making the game more approachable and easier to understand for even even the dying the war spectator struggles to understand some of this now i mean even rob baxter down at x2 can't shut up about it basically is very very worried about this latest development so that that's my frustration even though it's logic. Um, it's well above my pay grade, as you can well imagine, but I would love nothing more than the reason when I started refereeing is you give a decision what you feel is the best decision for that game. I'd love for nothing more that in the professional game, we could use that analogy and we stay, stick with that approach. We still need the buy-in of every single person around that table. The, the, we've got commercial elements. We've got uh, you know the criticism that comes in. And I would love nothing more uh, before I finish my career to go back to referees making the best decision because they're the person, the captain of the ship on the pitch. But all that takes is one perceived wrong decision. And people then look to, right, well, how can we eliminate that one every 10 years wrong big moment? Well, hang on, let's let's change the chairs around the tables. Let's bring another one. Let's bring in this. Let's bring in that. We, at some stage, we've got to either accept mistakes or have we gone too far with technology, similar to football and VAR now? Now it's in, there's no going back. Do we just go with it and make it to the best of what we do? And, and Brendan, I'll take it as a compliment to the English lads. First of all, what you said about us hopefully being... It was, it was meant as a compliment, Lou. Thank you. Being world leaders, we work, we work bloody hard within the Premiership to try and be as consistent as possible in the five games every weekend. But also, we work with our TMOs, making sure that we're not faffing around for too long taking decisions that we're trying not to get howlers wrong and i think if there's a simple message that uh, anyone watching or listening can take for refereeing in the autumn internationals the referees have two aims really probably three aims and i can talk for myself that every try is correct or at least is 98 percent correct rugby will always find the knock on from 13 phases ago that maybe you got missed but you know that's the that's the way sometimes the cookie crumbles. So tries correct, big moments correct, and cards correct. I think if we can get, or even not correct, followable, if we can get big moments followed by the general public and cards followed by everybody, then I think we're halfway there into keeping the players the forefront of the, of the product. Where we lose sight of that, where we give a wrong card or a non-followable card or a non-followable decision, is where we end up being thrust into the spotlight. And it's not where we want to be. Unfortunately, and I'll go back to my earlier point, we're the unlucky spokesperson to deliver messages every time. 
Um, and you know, that's just the, the kind of that's that's part of the job, I guess. And talking about delivering messages, there was a little paragraph at the end of all this about you are now invited to address 82,000 people on a stadium mic whilst you're trying to get your head together and put all this together and put all the income and information together. Is, is that useful? Because sometimes in that process, you hear it because we hear it on the, you know, on the TV sometimes. You, you can either change your mind halfway through or you suddenly realise that you might have got this wrong to a certain extent and you and you change tack. If you're doing this live in front of 82,000 people, that can be quite awkward. It could be, uh, but, I, but I go back to the things that we can control. When I go to Sandy Park and I watch a game down here, and my mum said it years ago, as a spectator sport, it isn't great when you're sat in the stands because you get no, if you don't really know rugby inside out, as hopefully we do, if you're watching a game and you're watching a referee give these penalties at scrums or a decision around, we don't know what is being given. So we can't really grow that part of the game very far. So we've got an accountability to give when we're making these big decisions to take people with us. So how can we, how can we not take people with us is by not telling those 80 odd thousand people in the stand, what's going on. I went to watch Liverpool last year, play at Anfield. And when VAR was first coming in and Liverpool scored a goal, the crowd went nuts. And then for the next 90 seconds, there was silence whilst all it said on a screen was VAR checking. That's a useless and pretty poor spectator experience before you start saying how much tickets are and all that carry on. We need to make it as followable as possible. Does it add extra pressure on? Perhaps. It makes us more articulate and it makes us go, right, the agreement and the, the kind of behind the scenes bit that people won't know about is our voice will only be broadcast when we know we are giving our final decision. Yeah. So, so we can have our discussion with our team off air as such because that might confuse things even more. Once we go, right, thank you, everyone, here's what we're going to give, that's when the voice goes public. Well, that's reassuring because I thought that that decision-making process is a dynamic thing and it leaves you open to criticism if you're suddenly picking up on something you'd missed earlier on. Definitely. So yeah, that, that's, that is a bit more pressure on you, but that I think will work. And we trialled it in Rugby Championship in Australia specifically and it worked really well. A bit dependent on hardware, like it depends on what stadium you're in. If you're in Paris where it's quite open, it might be a bit of a different atmosphere to when it's at Cardiff and everyone's on top of you. So, yeah. again, we've got to try our best to make it a better spectator product than I think where we probably are at the minute. Um, and, it, and it summed it up quite nicely to me in my local pub the other night when someone said, well, I don't go and watch rugby anymore because I don't really understand what's going on. I'd rather sit on the sofa and watch it on the telly because I get commentators, I get replays, I get ref mics, TMO mics. And, and perhaps we've pushed that too far without considering the, the, the general public in sat in the stands who actually pay for the sport to be pushed forward in a number of ways. Look, I, Luke, I'm, I'm, I'm concerned about another area where I think things are pushed forward too far. Yeah. And that is the entertainment factor. Referees yeah. getting bound up in the principle of being arbiters of entertainment. Um, it, you know, how important is this as far as referees are concerned? You know, I mean, what concerns me is the pressure on referees to award tries despite it meaning leniency towards forward passes. And it happens a lot. I'm looking back at the Exeter Quinns game. It's a clear forward pass where Hammersley scores, Hodges forward pass to him. There's one ruled out where I think it's... Uh, it, um, it was Murley. Murley virtually identical. Look, you know, in if the Premiership wants to be taken seriously, if the Premiership wants to be seen as the top of the top of the club game, you can't have games decided on entertainment factor. You know, I heard one of the commentators shouting, oh, well, that was such a great, you know, when there was a forward pass call back, that was such a great try, let it stand. Yeah. You know, I mean, I, I just think it's... Yeah, nuts. that was a Bristol game, wasn't it? Yeah, I, I think it's absolutely nuts. The other thing that concerns me a great deal is what's happened to the scrum. You talk about 45 minutes it takes to get a scrum set and so on and so forth. Look, the hurry up around the scrum, hopefully the one 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 clock that um, that might help is the scrum setting clock because people go down, tie bootlaces, get water, et cetera, et cetera. They'll string it out for as long as they can unless they're told to get off their backsides and scrummage. Mm. Um, I, I'm, I'm concerned that the way, you know, 
you don't see all that many scrums actually completed. Now, you know, because of, you know, penalties called. Now, for me, if the right side has advantage, i.e. the attacking side has advantage, and, and the thing slews, let it slew. Because if it does, the advantage to the scrummaging side, if it chooses to, is huge. If the blind side or, or one side of it is opened up, let the scrum play out as far as possible if there's no endangerment or whatever. And if it breaks down and in the in the first instance, then, you know, call it back, whatever, you know. But don't go to the whistle. It just seems to be that there's a real um, drive among referees to blow up. Let if if a side's ascendant, let it be ascendant. So picking up on your two points, Nick, and you speak a lot of sense there. Um, first of all, I blame that non uh, that try by extra on the dodgy assistant referee who probably wasn't concentrating at the time because it was me. Um, <laughs> but I, I think when the entertainment fact is spoken about, I think is really interesting because we can't decide entertainment on black and white decisions that are right or wrong. There may be a perception that we sometimes do, and I understand why. But we can't be creating entertainment by allowing things that are simply wrong. That, that's impossible. Where we can add value or add entertainment, if, if the entertainment word exists in a game of rugby, is around all the grey areas that we have, which are loads, plenty of them. We have over 300 rucks in a game. There are lots of rucks which are grey. That's where we can add flow. We can add speed. We can add entertainment. Because we can decide, actually, no, that's not effective. Get the ball out nine, get it away. We can decide if someone's trapping someone in. No, don't take the piss, don't buy a penalty, get rid of the ball. That's where I think we have to get back to, if that's the perception out there, that we're not doing that. We've got to allow referees not to be robotic, not to see X equals Y and blow the whistle. Like, I always remember, and you go back to Ed Morrison days, who was my first boss when I started at the RFU. Refereeing is still an art form. It's not some scientific thing that you can just create. And if it was that easy, you'd have lads or girls lined up at the door to be doing the job. It's an art. And it's and it takes an art, a bit like journalism, I imagine. You don't walk in on day one and become the best journalist. Same as you don't walk in off day one as being a referee and be the best referee in the world. So you've got to allow that kind of individual to put their style on the game. And that's where I hope entertainment comes from is adding that pace, adding that uh, quip. And it's not, to be, it's not to be a celebrity. You know, perhaps Nigel had a very unique way and a fantastic way of dealing with players. You can't recreate that because that was his own way. Wayne had his own style. Jerome Garces and the French boys have a brilliant style, but you can't do that as an English person. You can't put on the French accent, even though I do sometimes, and try and take players and, you know, and and shut them up in some circumstances. So that's yeah. where I hope the entertainment comes in on the autumn tests. In terms of the scrum, you're dead right. I mean, the, the concern and the worry with scrums is, as you rightly mentioned, is the safety aspect. You know, all and and I and I get it. The, the general view out there is that we are our sport is living in a bit of fear. I feel at the moment for right reasons and for 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 reasons that are, again, well above my pay grade, we got this ongoing kind of story in the background about concussion, which is obviously severe, and we're trying to do our utmost at the RFU and at World Rugby to try and mitigate any danger we can. We still need to live in the real world that rugby is a physical sport, and yeah. it, 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 it sometimes isn't that safe. But then neither is me driving my car up to London every Monday morning at half past four, because who knows what's going to happen in a car? There has to be an acceptance that we operate in a physical sport, which we're trying our best to make as safe as possible and just give us that bit of scope and that, that, that less fear and less worry that if we do something and, and something happens, that we're trying our best to make it as safe as possible rather than the pendulum swing the other way and we are blowing up every time the scrum hits the deck. And you can't look back, can you? Because everything changes and you sound like an old... You know, an old person is when you start saying, well, rugby back in the day was this. But there are bits and pieces we can pull back from, from the sport if years gone by. And perhaps around that scrum setup and getting back to the focus of scrums being a restart, not a way simply to milk penalties is one of them. Yeah. Um, there's lots, you know, we, we could spend forever and a day, fellas, over I a think that The first thing with, with the scrum is, is that I don't like this bit about it being a restart. It's a competition. Yeah, it's a competition first, 
it may be a restart sec second, but it's a competition first. People with a lot of skill, a lot of power, a lot of technique, and they should be allowed to play their part in the game. Oh, absolutely. And I'm, I'm all for that. I still want to see a good competition pushing for the ball and inevitably, hopefully, with the right team getting the ball out of the back of the eight's number feet and the ball being passed out. That's what I mean by competition. Not, not simply a, a rugby league style in, out. That's, that's, that's boring. There's nothing greater than watching a scrum. The problem with it is there's nothing worse than watching a game where there's dozens of resets, dozens of penalties, players going for a yellow card. And, and that's where we make it a very complex sport. Well, that's an attitudinal thing, isn't it? And 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 coaches, coaches in particular, and players by extension, have to play their part in this. If people are scrumming for penalties, um, this was one of Brian Ashton's great beefs. That if people are if people are scrummaging specifically for penalties, i.e., shots it uh, that it be shots at goal or to get territory, then you've got a little bit of an issue. A little bit of an issue because that becomes a very, very narrowly focused and potentially quite dull aspect of the game. I think, Chris, I think, I think in rugby and refereeing specifically around any area of the game, if players are cheating, we got to go hard on them, penalise them, bin them, whatever we got to do, and that goes with the scrum. Crouch mindset, player deliberately collapses it because he knows he's going to be beaten, so he chucks it on the deck. Go hard at those players, players who are in the contest creak go backwards and it all slowly comes down just because they're beaten well to me the penalty is you're on the deck you're out of the game for the next 10 seconds while you get your head out of the muck and you're trying to get back into the sport meanwhile the team with the ball have probably got extra space because they've got two or three players tied up on the deck that's where i think we've got to dissect where we want to blow our whistle is it deliberate player going nah you just try to get out of that because you know you're up against it or are you trying to stay in the mix are you trying to battle Keep battling, but you're just beaten by on that yep. one scrum by a bigger or better player. And I'm, I'm just really not relieved. Luke, I'm, I'm really relieved, Luke, that just now you you said that refere refereeing continues to be an art form. You mentioned Ed Morrison. I mean, Ed's an old mate. He lives at the road, um, and and he he quite openly in his heyday accepted that he would shape his refereeing to the circumstances of a game. If it was a, I mean, and this is years ago, so the game's moved on a, a whole lot. And I don't expect you to be able to say that you do something absolutely similar. But in Ed's day, if it was a complete dogfight, then he would referee slightly differently. It's still the same law book, but he'd referee slightly differently in the spirit of what he was doing to reflect that by the same yardstick. If it was a barbarian star chuck about, he would possibly just get a little bit lax on one or two things to allow the game to flow in the way that both sides were playing. Do, is there any part of that in what you can do now, Luke, because you're being assessed in the stand all the time and you're, you're, you know, you're on the TV, you're on the big screen. Is, is there any way that you can fit in with the spirit of a match? Definitely. And I think the best referees will do it regardless of what a um, person in the stands or what a boss says. I think the two words that are missing from refereeing a lot of the moment is contextual judgment. And a game, so I'll well, give you... I'll I'll give you tonight's contextual. <laughs> I'll give you an example. So Newcastle, the Exeter the other week, I'm in the middle of refereeing it. It's a nip and tuck game. The pressure on both teams is probably up there because, it, you know, of the circumstance of neither team winning a game. Newcastle chasing a win at home, Exeter under the pump. I have to make sure that I am, if there is something clear and obvious at that breakdown, blowing my whistle. Both ways, for 80 minutes. Because I know that game is probably not going to open up the way I want it to. And we'd love eight tries. It ain't going to happen. So I've got to make sure that I am refereeing. And I, and I talk about refereeing as a percentage. I am 99% referee in that game. If I've got a game which is 52-48 and players are missing tackles to allow people to go and score tries, well, my scope of greatness probably opens up a little bit around that breakdown. Because it's not so viciously competed. It's not the scrums, the balls coming in and coming out, I get a bit more wiggle room. But I think that's what makes the best referees because they understand what, what's happening in front of them, what, what we can't be doing. And, and that will change game to game. I'm refereeing France v Argentina. What I'm planning on refereeing France Argentina this year is very, very different to the game I refereed three years ago in France Argentina because that game used to be, and I'm really hoping it's not going to be, with Argentina now playing some really good, attractive rugby, it's a different 
kind of caught compared to what it was in years gone by, where all they wanted to do was scrum and maul, and there wasn't much play elsewhere. There'd be a big fight, loads of cards, everyone in the mud, not a great advert. I'm hoping in the end of November, France-Argentina, it could be actually quite an attractive game. So, so my mindset and my approach can give players a bit more rope to play with. But it's, again, we get back to that point, it's still got to be player-led. Not ref- It's not down to me to decide how that game's going to be, but it, I've got to be good enough to adjust very, very quickly if I know, oh, this game isn't quite going as I thought it would do. This now needs roll your sleeves up, get stuck in some, rather than sit back, anything goes, and all of a sudden it's a it's a shit fight at the breakdown. So that's... Yeah. And, and that comes, I guess, that comes like everything with experience, doesn't it? And you just got to try and... I, I, and I and I'm almost I'm almost finished. You'd be glad to know. I I still think uh, with all these kind of um, directives from World Rugby, with all these reviews, all these assessments, if I can go into a meeting or an assessment or a review with my bosses and say, I understand you might think that that might be wrong, but here's why I did this. Here's my logic about this decision. Here's why that on this game these two incidents are two yellow cards. In a different game, they might be two red cards. But here's the logic of why I did it. People go, yep, fair enough. That, that makes sense. I'd much rather people referee that way than saying, here's a directive. No ifs, no buts, no maybes. That's what you're doing. Yeah. And that makes, all that creates is robotic referees. And, you know, those people who enjoy watching a rugby for the contest as it is, you need to sit somewhere in the middle, I'd suggest, rather than being one way or the other. Just to jump in there, Luke, I think you mentioned Nigel Owens having his own style and no mm. one can recreate that, etc. I, I, I think, and, and I mean this as a compliment as well, I think you have your own style. And one part of that, probably the biggest part of that in terms of what makes you unique as, as a referee is your communications, communication style. You were commended over the summer when you admitted on Twitter a wrong call. Um, You know, even things like that, you're very hold your hands up about your mistakes, both on the pitch and off it after the game and during it as well. Is that something that you have sort of modelled or moulded, maybe is the better word, over the years, especially to one, keep the spectator clued in, two, I feel it adds to the spectator experience. Some people might feel otherwise, and I'm sure you're aware of that as well. Um, so, you know, where do you think the, the needle was towards the start of your refereeing career and where do you think it is now? I think with every uh, with every walk of life, when every experience comes, you get a bit more wiser and a bit more long in the tooth and you get, you just want to be honest with people and, you know, not everything that we do as referees will be correct. That's just the way it is. Um, if we can kind of not... Point one, not keep making those mistakes. That's a really important point. If you keep making the same mistakes, you're probably not learning from what you did so wrong in the first place. But I think it's it's essential that we are seen as human beings in the middle of the park, not people who are just blowing whistle and, and refereeing a law book. Um, if we end up refereeing a law book, we'll end up with 40, 50 penalties a game and nobody wants to watch that. And I don't want to referee that. So I think it comes with age, Ollie. I think that, that uh, acceptance that... You've got to be comfort in a style that fits within a consistent take the premiership. I can't be an outlier. You know, me saying use it so quickly the last 12 months before it came in officially was probably me pushing something that others weren't following. And teams, coaches, spectators don't want to see games that are so far apart in terms of approaches and refs. So we've got to be seen to be kind of collective and pushing something. But allow referees to have their own unique style. Back in the day when Spreaders and Ed were refereeing and Brian Council, you had three individuals with very unique styles. You had games where Spreaders would shine, but Ed probably wouldn't look as good. And then vice versa, where it, this is an Ed game. This is an Ed Morrison kind of game, not a Spreaders game. You know, and, and I guess that's similar to playing, isn't it? You know, you look at the England team for this weekend, Steve's made choices on players because he thinks he's right for this game against New Zealand. It's no different in refereeing. We get chosen or selected because, yep, we think this referee fits this game. You you, know, and, uh, quite, you, sorry, Luke, you, you've made it quite clear that as a referee, you, sti- you, st- you, you still cherish the responsibility and embrace the responsibility of making big decisions. I know stuff's going to TMO, this, that, and everything else, but you still seem to cherish that ultimate responsibility side of refereeing. Yeah. Given what's happened to cricket, could you ever see? Could you ever imagine yourself as a cricket umpire with everything going upstairs and basically you're holding jumpers now? 
I, if that happens, I'm not sure I'll prolong to be part of the sport because the reason I go back to the start of the conversation, the reason I first started was to try and give the best decision possible when I'm captain of the ship to make the best decision for that game. Now, if it's right or wrong, I carry, I carry the can. Um, and I think the worry and the concern for the sport in the future is we're trying to get perfection. Perfection doesn't exist in sport, especially not in rugby. And all we're doing is just making it someone else's decision, someone else's decision, someone else's decision. That's, in my view, be fantastic to bring it all back in, bring it all back in and go, right, you got the ref and the two assistant referees. Now, there has to be an acceptance that we ain't going to get anything right, everybody. So you want to put up and shut up or we're going to end up bringing in other areas where we have to move things further down the line. I'm still not sure we're settled on where the pendulum wants to be in our game. Still think we go from, oh, let the referee be the leader and let the referee make all the decisions. Then the one howler, which will happen inevitably. Oh, hang on. Why aren't we using technology? And we, we, we still float between the two. Um, and who knows, in years to come, maybe that irons itself out and it becomes a bit narrower. So I think that probably has happened in terms of the video ref. Um, but we also make sure all we want are the big moments correct. And if we, if I make a big howler in Paris on the 22nd of November, I want my TMO to say, whoa, hang on, hold your horses. That's wrong. Do this. What I don't expect is my TMO to be going on every decision. Stop the game. Check. Stop the game. Check. How we get there is is... I kind of kind of the answer to everything, isn't it? Yeah. yeah. Lou, I know so I'm I'm conscious of us getting carried away. We're sort of heading towards perhaps the <laughs> necessary juncture. Um one to sort of come full circle with things, I wanted to just raise one more issue with the red card and entertainment has sort of been the, the crux of this discussion. And I think you'll agree that part of the um even though if it hasn't been explicitly said, part of the decision is entertainment based i.e if a player goes off five minutes into a game nobody wants to watch a squash watch a squash match 15 versus 14. our argument or certainly this is the brendan argument is that quite often a 14 player side will be galvanized um you know the rugby world cup final was a fantastic game the premiership final was a fantastic game and so i guess do you feel that certain that certain arguments such as the one I've just sort of loosely laid out undercuts that thesis slightly, or do you think it, there are sort of substances behind it? Um, I break it into two, two parts. I mean, it's not me avoiding the question in the slightest. I think the first part is it takes pressure off me and the fellow refs in the middle, because you know, if it's orange and there'll be discussion about, could it be yellow? And the other team will say, well, it should have been red. This 20 minute red card is the perfect solution because nobody really gets too upset because they continue at 15. Um, chatting with, with the RPA, I don't believe the data as you've put is forefront to say it makes the game more entertaining to keep 15 v 15 for the, for the reasons you've alluded to. Um, the entertainment factor and the commercial value and all those kind of carry on that comes with it is something that doesn't really get into the referee's head on the field. The big player, of these both the bunker roll and the 20 minute red card is the reduced pressure and reduced fear which reduces the time it takes to review a decision to get to the final outcome yeah. um, and i guess you know if if at the moment and brendan you're probably right when you said earlier about you need to be doing quite a lot to get a red card at the moment it needs to be darker red than it what it used to be you know we were giving quite light red cards when it first came in We've probably nudged it to a, a darker shade now to, to make it red. And that's, that's the honest truth when you look at the first six rounds of the Premiership. We just want to make sure that those dark reds, the ones that are really bad, still carry the full price of 14 players. Um, otherwise, you know, we're going to end up with a sport that may not be in the right direction that we want to take it. Um, if, if, if the light reds are given 20 minutes because of a message we want to send out, but it keeps the team at 15, I can... I can I can go with it. I can understand the rationale with the concern that we're not discarding the dark reds um, to allow someone to do something really bad, but then have 15, have 15 v 15 just because yeah. of a reason of entertainment. That that doesn't sit well with me as a, a rugby person, let alone a referee. And just, just one follow-up there, Luke. Um, and I, I sort of queried it the other week in my column. I don't quite get the logic of two yellows, which would have been an automatic full red, are now going to be 
a 20 minute red because you can have two professional fouls which can have cost the opposition 14 points and decide the match and you still only get a 20 minute red now that doesn't seem quite right to me on, on as much as anything on a logical point of view fair point it's a very good point um, but I go back to the earlier point. There will always be these anomalies. There will always be something to go, oh, hang on. What about that? Or, oh, that doesn't quite fit. So what about that? And I guess that's one of those, Brennan, that teams might play to that. They might. Well, you, know, you, know, well, you know, this game, somebody will. Somebody and, will have and, you know, you go, back, you go back to the, the another tweak in the law about no scrums after a free kick at the scrum. Clearly, some teams will look to give away a free kick on the first scrum. Let's not let's let's call a spade a spade because it takes away that competition at the scrum on the next one. But that's another unintended consequence of something that we're trying to tweak. Um, and again, because the game is so insular in terms of every law has a knock-on effect to another law, we've got to be careful how much we push things because we might end up with a sport that we weren't trying to get to by making these changes at the start. Yeah, I'm conscious of time. There was one more thing I wanted to flag with you, Luke, and I, I don't know if your salmon is ready by this point, um, <laughs> even if it's cold. Um, Incinerated. <laughs> one issue that we anticipated last week, and I, I, I can't remember the direct quote, but the, the idea is to obviously penalise the player and potentially the team, but not the game. We feel that there's a concern um, with this, that the, the lack of penalisation for the team relative to, to before would undermine the work World Rugby has done to obviously improving tackle height issues and things like that. I think Chewy's summons ready. <laughs> Hence the alarm just went off. Um, my point is a 20 minute red card is not as severe a punishment as obviously a player being sent off the entire time. The team is less negatively impacted by it. And therefore, obviously, coaches don't necessarily need to adapt tackle ideology as they've probably started to do over the past few years to mitigate the risk of a player being sent off for 79 minutes of the match. Is that still the same question? Yeah. <laughs> um, Ollie, I, I hear you. And it, look, I guess I don't mean to, uh, to, to divert the question, but that's for people are further up the food chain to consider, really. We've yeah. done a lot. All I know is. For someone at the coalface over the last five years, we've done a, a lot of work, some ugly, some good, in trying to change player behaviour. Um, and, and we've got pretty far down the line, I think, in convincing people to come with us. You know, it's not that long ago where a player made a head-on-head -head collision upright. I remember Ulster versus Claremont years and years ago with a head-on-head -head collision. And we were like, oh, well, that's just an accident. That's not That can't be foul play. We're now at a stage where I think everyone knows um, even my mum who watches will go, oh, you can't do that because he's hit him in the head. So we've done a lot of work. We don't want to kind of untwangle that and unwind that and go backwards. Uh, and hopefully, and I'm aware that the judicial system is tweaking it, not for the automation series, but with the, the simplicity of automatic bans moving forward, I believe. So not for, again, reiterate, not for November, but moving forward, the plan is to bring in a much simpler judicial system so if you do end up with a 20-minute red card, then it's a two-week ban. Or then it's a yeah. if it's your second one, it's four-week ban, or whatever the numbers may be. I'm not too good at quoting the kind of framework, but rather than this court hearing of, oh, well, if you go guilty, then you might get one week off, then you go tackle school, and there's this, and which confuses everybody. We're just trying to make it things as simple as possible. So hopefully a 20-minute red card will work. Players get put off because the sanctions are simpler to apply and will be applied easier with that doesn't become a change in player behavior yeah the proofs the proofs in the pudding and um, we're going to see over the next four weeks whether it will work um the, 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 and i'll finish with it ollie the, the joy of our sport is we're, we're, we're not too proud to not to tweak things and i think people don't like change no one does i don't i can't stand it but we've got to be open enough to tweak stuff and trial it at the highest level you know and go um but then but not be too proud to say no that hasn't worked let's go back that, 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 that's clearly not making any benefit to the sport. You know, I'd love to be able to drive five seconds to three seconds at the breakdown. You know, when we call use it, rather than allowing players to continue, three seconds. Why have we got to wait for the council to meet to approve that in months to come? You know, the 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 scrum outcome of a saying use it and not using it. Well, to me, a free kick would be a far better outcome. Gets the ball back in play, gets the team moving. Teams would be worried about slowing it down because you can tap and go from a free kick straight away. 
we've got to be open enough to go, right, we, we got this in. That's now the consequence of it. No, 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 that's right. Well, that's wrong. Let's tweak it. Let's, let's go back to how it was without undoing the fabric of rugby union, which is maybe harder said than done, isn't it? Yeah. With automatic bans, I'm not prepared to watch a sport where England can't travel with their own QC. <laughs> on that on that note, I think my <laughs> challenge is always taking Joe out. Is a, is a statement, not a question. <laughs> Luke, it's taken Chewy an hour to make a shit joke. So you should take that as a blessing rather than a curse to leave with. Um, I but will. always compelling to hear you um, speak off the pitch and on it. So a pleasure to have you join us and do so as well and put up with our our probing and our questions. Um, but no, look forward to seeing you in the middle. France, Argentina, isn't it? And then your AR for a couple of others as well. Um, so, Thanks for uh, having me, guys. And uh, yeah. let's hope that November goes well all around there. Yeah, <laughs> Thanks very much. much. Thanks for Thanks. Great. Yes, Thanks. See you. Take care, Luke. Bye. Guys, let's do... 20 minutes around the autumn. What are our, what are our thoughts? Is Can I just working? say that he should referee end every game? Yeah, oh. he's, he's, he's the best there is now, Luke, I think. Oh. Yeah, I, I agree. I agree. Absolutely, absolutely yeah. outstanding. And, and, and actually, one of those guys, a bit like the people we were talking about from the, from, the, from the past, I mean, a rugby bloke with his heart absolutely in the right place. That's yeah. the thing. There's no pedantry about him at all. Unlike us, we're all pedantic here, but, um, but no. it was interesting to hear. And I hadn't picked up at the time when he was doing that. Use it, use it. He, that that was off his own bat. That wasn't mm. an official memo, you know. Because he started doing it about eighteen months ago, didn't he? Two years ago. Oh, and, another and, and, official five second rule or yeah. law, sorry. Um, and that wasn't that wasn't the official. Um, law at the time, he was just that was his interpretation of what needed hey, to happen. Hey, the, game, the games he was refereeing at that point were like chalk and cheese with everyone else. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And I've, I've never seen anything like that in terms of contrast of refereeing approaches. Yeah. You've got one bloke doing this, everyone else doing this, and we quickly realized what we preferred. Yeah, yeah. I tell you what, what, one thing I didn't realize about the bunker system is that as soon as it goes to the bunker, it can no longer be a full 80 minute red. Or however many minutes read. I don't know if yeah, you guys I haven't got that at all. A lot of this stuff is beginning just to come come out now, isn't it? Really? Exactly. So I think that's a great piece of information. And it also we spoke about the the number of possibilities as soon as it goes to the bunker. At least it it you know it condenses that somewhat. Um Isn't that so... about the authorities not to tell the pay in public what's going on. <laughs> <laughs> wow. But it sounds like the refs are only just learning now. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it sounds like it's going to be a. Yes, a Luke's, Luke's going to be suspended for not doing what they did, what they forgot to tell him to do. So, <laughs> oh dear. All right, guys. Well, look. Let's um. Oh, sorry. I'm playing around with the layout. I don't mean to do that. Um, let's talk a little bit about. I mean, Steve borthwick has gone early. He's gone two days early with his side. Um, it's obviously quite a big autumn given the coaching reshuffle. Obviously, his um. His defence coach, Felix Jones, is out. Joel Abd, one of his mates, um, as many people are billing it, is in. So there are more question marks than there were over the summer. Um, Kano, I'm going to come in in the front row with selection. Um, probably not the two strongest props scrummaging England could be producing. Um, the tight head struggles are absolutely clear. Um, no Joe Marder in the 23 as well. Um, what do you make of it all? Yeah, I mean, I, I think that there are quite a lot of anomalies there. And, um, you know, the front row is an on is an ongoing issue. Uh, we're going to find out how much of an issue over the next month. Um, but uh, I, I'm, I'm very surprised that uh, that Abano isn't in there, isn't, isn't even in the long squad. Um, because for me, he's he he's currently he fits the bill in terms of not only being a pretty solid scrummager, but also he's he's shown for, in his form for Bath, he's very, very dangerous close to the line. You know, he's he's scoring as almost as many tr tries as Thomas Dutoy. Um, so I am, yeah, I am surprised. I'm also surprised that uh, I know that I've, I've sort of written that it's too soon for, for Sogbon, but I've looked... Over the course of the, the the season so far, the strides that he's made, the confidence he's playing with, he, 
I would say, um, is probably the best tight head that England has at the moment. He's 20 years old. Um, he's a phenomenal prospect. Uh, and I think that some countries, you know, would 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 have bought him in. Definitely. Well, especially you have to take into account, Nick, don't you, who he's playing for? That is, that is that is not a powerhouse pack up there. Well, I don't know. When they've got Rapava Ruskin along yeah. alongside him, I think yeah. that that's a pretty yeah. a pretty yeah, well, that, solid front row. Yeah, road. but that's, that's that's three times a season because I mean, sadly, I mean, I I, I really rate uh, Rapava Ruskin. However, his injury record is is not good. a bit of an issue. But it's it, it, it's not as though it's a Bayham off pack, and so so there's a lot on him. As a twenty-year-old, yeah. as you as, as you say, I mean, and tight head, tight head is one one hell of a position to be making do and mending for other people. It's more in the tight. It's intriguing that against, you know, the opposition that he's faced in the in the Premiership so far, he has not looked in trouble once. No, but that's and, my point. That's and, exactly my point. Yeah. and the shape that he's, you know, that he's in, you don't see his back bend or. At, at all he's very very good and he, his work rate around the field is also extremely good and his hands are good too so i think he's a hell of a prospect i'm surprised he's not on the bench yeah you know yeah. I, and i'm surprised he's not in the he's not in the long squad either so oh. you know i'm very surprised about that as far as the rest of the uh, of the of the selections concerned um, I don't have a any r real issues in the back line, I, uh, other than the fact that I don't believe um, that after 55 minutes, I hear Steve Borthwick saying that Henry Slade is absolutely, you know, on point when it comes to fitness and so on. What he's not is on point when it comes to match fitness oh. and, and, and match preparedness. He's played 55 minutes this season. And now he's in against the All Blacks. Now, I know that he's key to the defence, but you've got to question it. And Tom Curry, I don't think Curry's had – I wouldn't say he's had an awful season, but I, I think he's been been middling. Um, the fact that Underhill's nowhere to be seen is a – you know, is, is – and has been gazumped by Ben Curry is, you know, really quite surprising. Um you know, Sale are not, you know, are not going great guns at the moment. Well, I think neither um, Curry is playing particularly well, Nick. And the fact no. that this is the first time they've been in England 23 together is a bit ironic. I don't think either of them's playing anywhere near as well as they can play. And considering yeah. the strength England have in back row, I'm, I'm a bit nervous about it. I mean, no Tom Pearson, no Tom Willis. Well, these other guys had better really be 100% on their A game. I've also... We're, we're big fans of Cunningham South, but I get a slight feeling of second, se second season syndrome with him at the moment from what I've seen of him with Harlequins. So he needs a big one. He's got to reduce it off not not a lot of um, minutes and form in, in the premiership so far. So And then you've got Don Brandt on the bench. What, is he two games back into his comeback? Yeah. You know, what should be an absolute point of strength for England against what will always be a good All Blacks back row I'm feeling a bit nervous about it. I'm not sure they, they've got it right, the selection right, the mix right. Well, the, the, the two blokes who are playing the house down are the two bath guys. Yeah. I mean, he'll, I mean, that, got, that kid, that kid Pepper, well, looks Pepper. that good, yeah, he looks a good player in, I mean, all right, a good player in the making, let's say. I'm not saying he should be playing this this, yeah. this weekend, but crikey, he looks, um, but Ted Hill, um, I mean, I know he's he he in the squad, but yeah. crikey, there ain't many playing better than him week on week at the moment. In any, yeah, it's, really strange, it's a strange back row selection all round. You know, I mean, there are four four back row forwards who are pretty well identical. They're all six one. They're you know they vary a little bit in terms of weight. So you've got the two Curries, you've got uh, you've got uh, Earl and. I can't remember who's who. Who else is in? Cunningham there. South. Well, Cunningham South's a bit rangier. He's a line out. Of the a room. big unit, but you've got three guys of six one. You know, I, I'm I'm still not convinced. You know, we're, they're talking about Earl playing not only at number eight, but also playing in the centre. If you know, if push comes to shove, 
I, I sort of look at it and think that they're painting themselves into a bit of a corner that they don't need to paint themselves into. Well, it would be the latest in a long line of England centres without a kicking game. <laughs> <laughs> you never know. You can do it all, that man. Yeah, yeah. I, well, we're going to I, find I, out because I, he, he came second to Surveyor in, you know... Yeah, I mean, the first point. But he's also been probably England's best player over the past 12 months. So, look, I I think L, L starts, right? It's just really you could be putting a Cunningham South at eight and then getting someone rangy in at six or something like that. Um, or a Ted Hill in at six. Anyway, yeah. guys, I wanted to ask about Joe Marler's comment um, for the hacker to be banned. 100%. In fact, the only time I've ever agreed with Joe Marler, I've done at least a dozen anti-hacker columns over the last 40 years. I could not agree more with him. It's a I nonsense. Have, and the way they do it is a nonsense. The way it's supposedly a challenge and you can't reply. They're so precious about it. Hollywood production, all of the above. It's a nonsense. That's, that's the issue for me. I, 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 don't, I, I don't particularly want to see the thing banned. You know, I mean, I think that for... An awful lot of fans. It adds to the drama, so on and so forth. But the fact that it's become so precious, so so much of a protected species, species. You know, I mean, the idea that nobody can even, you know, creep up on the side and put a bull's horn around them or something like that. You know, for, your nose. That, that's missing the terribly. idea that you've got to honour it by by standing in front of it. Go for a jog around the field like Campisi used to. You know. It's let them, let them play it out to the crowd. You know, I mean, I just don't believe that the, that the hacker should be sacrosanct. It's basically whatever the Kiwis say about it. It's got various different um, uh, sort of cultural significances. But the one that they put out on the field before they play is a war dance. Full stop. Yeah. yeah. And they they rev up on it. Everybody else is meant, meant to genuflect. Well, to hell with that. Yeah, so I, I would like to align myself not with Brendan. I would like to align myself with Nick to avoid the Kiwi knives in the comments. Um, I think the, the sort of the, the spectator part of the hacker is undeniable and it's something that not just the locals but everyone waits for. But two, all of the most popular versions of it have been when a response has happened. England 2019, France in the World Cup, uh, France when Sebastian Chabal was playing, you know, the, the, Richard uh, Cockrell was, back in the day with Norm Hewitt. Willie, Willie Anderson at Lansdowne Road was very funny. Uh, the, I, I have to say that the best one I saw was in the 99 World Cup when the All Blacks played Tonga, funnily enough, at Ashton Gate, which then wasn't a rugby ground. And they did their, um, they were, they were nose to nose to nose anyway. And they did their hackers or the equivalent simultaneously. And it just ended up in the most spectacular scrap, really. Well, the the really... same thing happened at Rugby World Cup 2003, right? Yeah, yes, it did. Yeah, it's good. I mean, with, with, with Marla, I mean, I, I don't care either way about the hacker. I mean, it, I mean, you, you know me, I get rid of national anthems personally. I just, I just wish they'd run on the field and get on with it. That's However, that's a shit national anthem. If we for, had a good one, you'd back it. For, for Marla, for Marla to say he had to get in touch with his own narcissism, I was surprised that a bloke with hair like him would describe himself as a narcissist. <laughs> <laughs> The other thing about the hacker, the only time I can stomach it is at Sevens Tournament. I'm there. At the end of every Sevens Tournament, Kiwis go round, take the applause of the crowd and do it in each corner. Well, that's fine. You know, that's a bit of entertainment. That's no, honouring their culture. By the time they get stuff. Yeah, but we don't want it before the bloody match in the pissing rain while people have got to stand there freezing cold. Oh, no, uh, your position. You, 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 also awesome. have to, you also have to remember that how, how pathetic the whole thing was before Buck Shelford turned it into something slightly more meaningful. Well, that's a cake, cake, wasn't it? <laughs> because when Nick describes it as a war dance, it wasn't much of a war. It was more like a pantomime act, wasn't it? You know, um, right back in the day. But Shelford gave it um, a malevolent kind of edge, yeah. which, which for quite a long period of time made it genuinely dramatic. Mm. But of course, we see it so often. We've seen it so often down the years. Yeah. I suppose it 
the 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 novelty of it is 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 gone. It's his impact in a sense is gone, and its impact certainly goes when the other side have to be what twenty yards away. Yeah. yeah. I think one other we didn't mention was Wales. The standoff um, was it two thousand and five? Oh Wales, yeah! Oh, that yeah. was. They really went into the changing room for their private moment and brought the cameras down to record the private moment. Yeah. I mean, nonsense. Yeah. Guys, let's get a prediction for Saturday. Um, just, just a, just, uh, let's get a, a margin and a winner, obviously, and then I'm going to go around the the virtual room for one to watch in the autumn. And player of the autumn as well. Um, I'm going New Zealand this Saturday. I may not have said that a couple of months ago, actually, even after we lost them two tests in a row. I think the coaching um, kerfuffle has been unsettling. And I think England's autumn international squad selections, both broader squad and now the 23 itself, have not filled me with confidence. Um, I'd love to be wrong. I hope I am wrong, but I'm going New Zealand. Is anyone else joining? Me? Yeah, I'm with you on that one. Um, I'm a bit nervous about this one. I'm not getting a good vibe about England at the moment. Don't know why, because they were useful in the summer, although subsequent results sort of shows that it wasn't quite as good as we thought, perhaps. I think New Zealand have got a lot of rugby under the belt in the last two or three months. Uh, they always turn up on business in November. Uh, and England will do very, very well to beat them. I, I think New Zealand by six or seven points. I agree with the margin as well. Kano? Yeah, I I, I would go with New Zealand, I'm afraid. Um, but I, I think that the margin will be very tight. Um, say, you know, three or four points, something like that. Uh, but I do think, yeah, I do think that they've they've got the they've got the edge. They did it twice in the summer. They've been through a rugby championship. They're the side that's together, um, whereas England are a little bit, you know, it's all, with all, everything that's been going on, it's all a bit fractured. Chewie, I can't tell if you're keeping very still or whether you've frozen. No, I think I you're not. No, no, I find it I find it difficult to call, actually. Um, like you, I don't have vast amounts of confidence about England at the moment because the sort of lack of continuity and the lack of stability both both in the coaching team and around some of the selections um alarm me but I don't I don't I think the all blacks are still trying to find their way as well and I could I, I wouldn't fall off my chair with shock if England won the game no I think I think I think New Zealand will win the tri count because they always do even when they lose to England which ain't that often they they win the tri count um but that's not that's not what decides the match. Um, just to be different, I'm going to say England by three or four. I, th I think Marcus Smith will have a, one of his days. Let's hope for some dry weather then. Um, all and right, I hope Ben Spencer has a good match. That bloke has been an absolute, you know, well, he's been so patient for start. 83 yeah. minutes in six matches. He's played his heart out ever since he's been down at Bath, initially in a, a struggling side, now in a good side. He deserves a day in the sun and he deserves a, you know, hopefully he strikes up a good relationship with Marcus Smith straight away. And because, well, you have to. If England are going to get anywhere near winning, that those halfbacks have to be purring. Guys, let's do a one to watch. Um, I'm not even sure if my one to watch is in this nation's squad, but I'm going to go with Rodrigo Iscro. Good research. Yeah, he is in the squad, and yeah, he's a good player, isn't he? he? He is in the squad, good. I just wasn't sure whether the squad had actually been announced. Um, class player, unbelievable around the seventh circuit for the past two years. Got hands, he's already tearing up for Quinns. Um, I hope he gets a couple of starts, and I'll be keeping an eye on him if and when he does. So he is mine. Um, did you want a match to look out for as well, did you say? No, um, player of the autumn as well. So not just an up-and-comer, but um, player of the autumn. But let's do one to watch first. Well, I'll up? dive in with um, Matt yeah. Flewellyn of Wales. Nice. Uh, every time I've seen him for Gloucester, he looks terrific. And he has got to be the archetypal Warren Gatland centre, has he not? I, can't, I imagine Gatland's getting pretty excited at his form. And if he's if he's in a back division with Ainscom and... and uh, Thomas Williams at scrum half, that sort of Gloucester 9, 10, 12. That could be quite influential for Wales, I think, this autumn. Yeah. 
I go, I go, I go. Wallace for TT is the best. He's, I, I mean, on on the limited evidence that we have so far, because he hasn't played that often, but he looks one hell of a player. I mean, he 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 looks a different class to a lot of more experienced international players. He just has time on the ball and a massive range of skills. I I, I think he's something special. He could put. Ardi Severa in the seven shirt, couldn't he? Um, yeah, yeah. I mean, I, I mean, I, I think rather like Michael Jones, and I'm not the only one to make this comparison. And believe me, I hold or held Michael Jones in such regard that I tend not to mention anyone in the same sentence. I think he's the greatest back row forward I've ever seen by a little bit, actually. But like Jones, he can play six, seven, and eight. Yeah, yeah. Go on, Kano, round us off. Well, look, I'm going to go, uh, despite, you know, not <laughs> backing England to beat New Zealand. I mean, the one player that I I feel has got, you know, the real star quality, real real world, world-class potential is Tommy Freeman. And uh, I'd like to see him. Uh, I would have liked to have seen him at 13. Um, uh, but that's not going to happen, uh, certainly. Uh, to start with against New Zealand. Uh, but yeah, I think that he's a player who just seems to have, he has the physicality, he has the speed, he's got the skill set. And um, I'd like to see him just go to that that next level where he he becomes one of the game stars. Yeah, yeah. You know what, guys? I like leaving it at one to watch. Um, I think we've outlined some, some stars to keep an eye on um, that maybe those at home didn't necessarily have quite so much on their, their radar. I think the usual suspects will be the usual suspects as well. Um, let's wrap up there. I apologize at home for the tech issues at the start. Um, I That was entirely on me, um, but I, pre- I assure we'll be up and running more properly with this new um, recording software next week. And we've got Alex Cuthbert coming on. Um, so we can look ahead to, it'll be Wales, South Africa that weekend and obviously England, Australia as well. They're playing and by games. next week, once Ollie has adjusted the contrast on the screen, everyone, you won't be able to see Brendan Gallagher at all. <laughs> <laughs> that's what the viewers really want. No, tune I think in. that's why you made the switch, <laughs> isn't it? <laughs> tune in, you know, it makes sense. Thanks for listening to this week's edition of the Rugby Paper Podcast. And don't forget to subscribe on whichever podcast platform you use and recommend the show to your friends. The Rugby Paper is available to buy every Sunday. And to make sure you don't miss it, subscribe through our print, digital and online options at therugbypaper.co.uk forward slash subscriptions. That's therugbypaper.co.uk forward slash subscriptions to get all our content for as little as 14p per day.